Hi all, let's go over the Magnus Carlsen Invitational, the final, round 12. So at this point in the final, Magnus Carlsen and Hikaru Nakamura have had one win, one win each. So it's all to play for. Magnus playing with the white pieces here. And we have d4. Nakamura plays knight f6. c4, e6, knight f3, d5. So it's queen's gambit decline territory. Bishop e7 here. Bishop f4. This is the new trendy move over recent in recent years has, has gained great popularity. e3, knight bd7. Bishop e2, d takes c4. And we get a symmetrical position here in terms of pawn structure after d takes, bishop takes c5. So is this a very, very exciting pawn structure to start off with? By the way, I'm messing around with a new, a new feature, which you might find amusing. Okay, if, if the game's boring, yeah, okay. There's another bit of entertainment for you, free of charge. Also, there's a great quotation. Play the opening like a book, a middle game like a magician, and the end game like a machine. So Rudolf Spielmann said that. Uh, we are in very uh, theoretical book territory here, but until this point, there's an innovative move that Magnus Carlsen played here. Maybe he stores these up for more uh, rapid time controls. Guess what he played for 50 points? You might want to pause the video. What innovative, interesting idea could you play here? Okay, knight g5. Yes, it's been ra rarely played. There is a stem game, though, for it. That is actually a stem game for this move. Uh, quite often here, a4 has been played. For example, in the game Ivan Sokolov against uh, Viktor Bologun in France 2003, that game ended uh, eventually in a draw uh, at move 40 uh, in this, this position. That was uh, a draw. Uh, so there, there are stem games. So knight g5, we have b5. Now we're into one stem game territory. In fact, b5 invites a sacrifice. If black wanted to, black could play h6 to kick this knight away. There's no sacrifice on either of these two uh, pawns here. The knight would have to go back. And this should be about equal this position. Uh, so, but h6 is a little bit weakening and, and maybe uh, Nakamura didn't really believe there was anything going on here uh, after b5. What is, what is possibly going on here? Guess what Magnus played in this position, if I give you five seconds to pause the video, for 20 points, because I've given you a bit of a clue. So white to play here, what would you play in this position? Okay, yeah, it's actually bishop takes e6. And usually, uh, conventional wisdom, you don't give away, generally, bishop and knight for rook, unless there's good compensation. There are a couple of pawns as well. so. It's it's in the balance. Uh, we have f takes. If h6, then knight takes f7, and white gets uh, quite good compensation here. White technically is better according to engines there. Uh, so f takes uh, was was played, and we have this knight coming in, forking queen and rook. Very exciting. Queen e7. Now here is where the that one last stem game. Is used up. The the one last stem game is queen e8, and that occurred in a very very high level game, uh, which makes me think you know maybe this this was seriously prepared for this innovation, and has Magnus Carlsen used it up? It could be like kind of an important innovation, because this stem game was between um, Wojciech two seven two five. <clears throat> against Andrikin 2724. So Super Grandmasters played in Jerusalem 2019. And that game went knight takes f8, bishop takes. And the funny thing about that game is that the black pieces managed to get into really good attacking uh, squares. I'll show you. And it actually secured, this entrenchment secures, secured black soon. Uh, enough dynamic compensation here after this knight's act to basically force white to have to resort to perpetual uh, after taking. Uh, there's no way to stop the perpetual um, 
frets. So, well, black black is the one seeking the perpetual by hitting h1, threatening h1 all the time. And there's nothing for white to do. The two rooks are at home. The knight, there's nothing to do apart from, except to draw here. So the perpetual frets of of checkmate. So that's a really really super interesting uh, stem game with queen e8. So maybe Magnus Carlsen is fully aware of this uh, stem game. Uh, the in interesting thing about this as well, I noticed, is that within this stem game, the engines actually didn't like queen c4. Queen a5 is a possible thing to investigate in this stem game. And so the dynamics of you know the rook and knight and bishop, they're actually not, it actually requires investigation. The queen on a5 is supporting the d8 square. And discouraging those sort of aggressive knight movements, it's covering that fifth rank. So this kind of thing, you know, maybe coming into d6 and doubling rooks and playing e4, it seems to offer white quite interesting uh, stuff. Uh, you know, as an example, just as an example, you know, white should be doing fine there. So it's really, really uh, an interesting line to investigate. This it seems, even if, even in longer time controls. So queen e7 was played here, not queen e8. The rook is taken, and now a really, really nice tactical move. It seems as though black's threatening to get real control over that e4 square and the diagonal. It, it looks as though, well, the black pieces will be cooperating very well on that nice common uh, central square. But white kind of puts a, a fly in the ointment, so to speak, a, sp a spanner in the works. Uh, substitute your favorite quotation there. <laughs> Raises an issue. 50 points for this move. White to play here. What would you play with the white pieces here? Okay. I'll take away the arrow if that was distracting. So white to play here plays. Can you guess? Very, very interesting move. Knight e4. And uh, black plays bishop b7 here. If knight takes e4, the point is it sort of weakens d5, that weakness of the last move, and then you just take the rook, and then white's doing really well. So knight e4, bishop b7 was played. And this takes out that bishop. Yeah, you might think, okay, th there might have been some other options as well, but uh, it looks as though white's also converging on the d6 square if black goes passive. It seems as though white's got interesting options. So anyway, the bishop's taken out. Rook c1, queen d5, which is a double attack. For anything mate and this pawn. So f3 looks a little bit meek, but it blunts that threat. And it also blunts more fundamentally the bishop's scope soon. So after uh, this, uh, if, by the way, uh, queen takes instead, this seems inferior after bishop takes. Black's pieces seem fine here. White might have a small edge. But the black pieces are controlling e4 crucially, it seems, and have scope and possibilities for, for the bishop liberating a bit more. So uh, f3, blunting that bishop as well as extinguishing the mate in one threat, but losing the a2 pawn. e4. Uh, so this is really interesting. Why not say rook c7? Well, if rook c7, bishop d5 is possible. And the bishop's not really blunted. It's in the game. It's alive, and it should be about even. The way Magnus has played it, he's blunted that bishop, stopped the bishop d5 resource coming into the position. In fact, the bishop is a kind of tactical target now to rook c7. Uh, we have knight f8. If black gets too greedy with queen takes b2, then rook c7. Uh, this looks. This isn't the computer suggestion. Bishop d5. It's ridiculous. Uh, and it's totally winning for white. And you might wonder, what? <laughs> yeah, because the thing is, if rook a7, e5, this is just crushing, crushing. Uh, because here, uh, d7 drops, and then white can even play with checks to win the rook. <laughs> it's just as an example. So, uh, yeah, it seems as though um, it's far too dangerous to take that pawn. So knight f8, leaving that b2 pawn. We have rook f2 protecting that pawn. So this battle of the rook versus the knight and bishop is very interesting. But it's in real contrast to that draw stem game we saw, where the, the black pieces at least cooperated to secure perpetual threats against the king. Here, the black pieces are kind of blunted, especially the bishop on b7. So rook c8, and in fact, OK, this simplification, but this nasty pin, which is reminiscent, actually, of a game we might have covered on the channel this game of um, 
David Howe in some tournaments where it was a, a crucial pin which seemed to swing uh, the game in White's favour. Howe was on the black side. I remember that. But this this immobility is really annoying in conjunction with Bishop d6. So Queen e6 is played. On check, I mean, White just plays rook f1 and then just takes the bishop, basically. So uh, Queen e6 protects the bishop. Uh, bishop d6, Queen e8, defending the knight now. The queen's come off. Bishop b4, keeping a, a, a blockade at the moment against a5. Knight e6, rook d2. So White's mobility of the pawns uh, are in these two pawns. If the king can come up and support f4, f5, you can see this becoming dangerous. The, the Both kings head towards the centre for a moment. And now g5, which stops f4 for a moment. Rook d6, we have knight e7, g3, knight e5. So the threat is knight c4 check now. That's stopped with b3, h5. h4, which fixes uh, down the pawns, especially h5 is a big target now. You see that h5 is quite vulnerable in this position. Uh, knight g6, we have bishop e1, a5, rook d5, so hitting both b5 and h5 a4 time is taken to take out that knight e f4 if a3 it's just no time to do anything with this white can uh, just yeah play like this for example get behind that pawn that tarash roll getting behind the pass pawn that's that holds it up so knight e f4 we have rook f5 a takes h5 and yeah this is uh close to winning for white but not with king takes f4 white plays bishop c3 here stopping this pawn if king takes f4 that runs into knight e6 check knight takes g5 and black is a piece up and with a big advantage so bishop c3 keeping things under control uh b4 the bishop just drops back into a nice blockade square so knight e6 this is desperate this is just a winning position now after taking out these two knights even though it's opposite colored bishops white has these two connected past pawns and this one blockader is stopping two pawns so white has an extra basically two connected past pawns essentially in this position with an a blockader which can't be dislodged that easily at all so uh, these pawns just make progress it's very very easy peasy now so up to e6 yeah king f6 Okay, King E7. And here, uh, Nakamura, he resigned. Yeah, the pawns are just crashing through. So actually, even though uh, it was a rapid game, I thought it was a really interesting innovation, Knight G5. Perhaps Black should have played H6. It seems as though that dynamic imbalance, the one stem game that exists, is actually really high-level stem game between two super grandmasters, both over... 2700 i call any grandmasters over 2700 super grandmasters so it's well worth investigating i think and there's possible upgrades to that game with queen a5 uh so very very interesting concept here knight g5 who would have thought in in that symmetrical pawn structure uh to get that dynamic piece in balance very very exciting stuff uh so i hope you enjoyed this game it, so it put magnus now 2-1 up so can Nakamura equalize in the next game? Cliffhanger here. Uh, so I hope you enjoyed the game as much as me. If you want to challenge me for a game, uh, kingscrusher.tv. If you register there, I'll be able to invite you for a game later or bit.ly slash chess world. There's also my suave chat forum at kingscrusher.tv slash discord where you can make game suggestions now, etc. And there's playlist bit.ly slash Leela chess, uh, bit.ly slash Magnus Colson chess, Okay, uh, I think there's a bit in Nakamura chess. Check that out. I'll put it in the description as well for Nakamura games. I'm a great fan of him as well. Fantastic player at all time controls. Really uh, entertaining style as well to me. Uh, so comments, questions, likes, shares. Appreciated. Thanks so much.